Agamani Jay Dave, Agrisa, Majin Moy, Dave Shah, Foster. I want to thank Fela for the invitation to speak at today's event, marking the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. And I've been asked to speak on the role of the community. And there's a lovely little shanakal, Tahoni Orin, Aska Ahela. We live in each other's shadow. So I want to use that as a the theme just tying my thoughts together. As you probably heard and know, Fela this year celebrates its 30th anniversary. In 1988, West Belfast was a militarised war zone. Heavily armed British troops and RUC officers occupied our streets. British Army and RUC <laughs> forts dominated the streetscape and main roads of this peaceful, mostly working class, mostly Republican community were straddled with huge sports. The movements of people were constantly monitored. House and street searches, military roadblocks, stop and search operations were a regular feature of life. We actually even had a curfew here at one point. And there was the ever-present threat of sectarian attack by Unionist death squads often operating in collusion with the British state forces. The IRA was also active. Conflict was a constant in the life of this community. The catalyst for failure was the killing in Gibraltar of three young local people. They were IRA volunteers, Maria Farrell, Sean Savage and Don McCann. In the two weeks that followed, nine other people died, another four from this constituency. It was a tragic depressingly sad, horrific time for the victims and their families. The people of this proud community were demonised and labelled by some as savages, as animals. This was the terrorist community. And Fela and Fubble was our response to this. It was the alternative to the bonfires and the rats that usually marked the August internment anniversary. It was our way of demonstrating to the world that the people of West Belfast are a generous, humorous, talented, gifted and inclusive community. Bela also had and has to this day an open door policy towards performers, artists and speakers from outside West Belfast. And today's event is an example of that, so I want to commend the organisers of this initiative. One consequence of the efforts of the British state to marginalise nationalists was a realisation that we had to rely on our own instance, <coughs> as exemplified by Fela, on our own ingenuity, on our own determination. From the establishment of the Central Citizens Defence Committees in 1969, who helped organise life behind the barricades, to the creation of tenants and community organisations, the people of West Belfast quickly learned to rely on our own resourcefulness because we had to. Between 1969 and 1972, there was within the North the largest movement of a civilian population within Europe since the end of the World War II. Thousands of families were forced to flee their homes. Some travelled south to refugee camps established by the Irish government. I remember many others being rehoused by us in half-finished houses in Twinbrook, Andersonstown, Moyard and other places. There were no windows, floors, doors or heating. These home, homes were literally built around these families. Incidentally, the main unionist parties campaigned against the building of Twinbrook. Bombay Street was burnt to the ground in pogroms. It was rebuilt by local citizens. In the midst of riots and street fighting, the bus services often collapsed. Out of that shambles emerged the black taxi service. Another example is the Irish language community in the Shaw's Road Gaeltacht. For years, the school community of Bunskull Football First ran an Ave school and a Bunskull with no state funding and against the opposition of a hostile Department of Education. I remember vividly the meeting I organised between the board of the Bunskull and the British Secretary of State, Mo Molum. <coughs> Mo told me before the meeting that her intention was to give the Shaw's Road Bunskull funding for the first time. She said she had not told her officials. When the meeting ended and we left her office, having been told funding 
was being granted, one of the department officials whispered to one of the Bunskull delegation, we'll get you in the long grass. I brought the delegation and the culprit straight back into Momolan and we faced him down in front of his boss. Sadly, that institutionalised hostility and antagonism was part and parcel of the system in the North. Some residues of this remain to this day. It was frequently reflected in the relationship between West Belfast and other government departments and agencies. Political vetting was introduced to deny funding to community organisations. For example, when the late Tom Cahill identified the abandoned Conway Mill as a project that could provide jobs and community and education-based services, we set up a community-based board in Father Des Wilson, and others worked hard to find the investment to make it possible. They too faced the hostility of the British state. Funding was refused for decades, including pay for crash workers. These policies were supported by elements in the SDLP, the Catholic hierarchy, and successive Irish government. Now, another people may have succumbed, might have given up, but not this community. And I restate all of this not to cast up, but to remind us of where we have come and where we are, and to give us a comparison with now, the potential for the future, and the past. The efforts for peace by the community were equally invaluable. Even in the darkest times, community groups in West Belfast sought to engage with our unionist neighbours, including unionist paramilitary organisations, and many times they responded very positively. Clannard Monastery was the cradle of the peace process. John Hume and I begun the Hume Adams initiative there. Des Wilson, Father Alex Reid, among others, played leadership roles. Later, when the negotiations formally began, Sinn Féin was locked out of talks for over a year. During that time, we engaged fully with our base. In September 1997, when we entered into talks, we were inundated with messages of support from outside. Local community groups faxed, posted or hand-delivered messages of solidarity, and I know that I, and I know that the Sinn Féin negotiating team, including Martin McGuinness, were encouraged and sustained by that support. When it was finally achieved, the Good Friday Agreement was a defining moment in our recent history. But it was, and is not, a settlement. It never pretended to be. It is an agreement on a journey, but not an agreement on the destination. For Republicans and Nationalists, our goal is a united Ireland, arrived at democratically and peacefully through a referendum on unity. For unionists, it's about the maintenance of the union. It's all for the people to decide. And that's both the strength and the weakness of the agreement. I believe that one of the successes of the peace process was our ability to persuade the vast majority of Republicans to embrace an alternative unarmed strategy to pursue Republican objectives. And once that was developed, Republicans enthusiastically applied ourselves to this task. Modern Sinn Féin and our significant support across this island is a result of that. And that's one of the greatest political transitions of modern Ang Anglo-Irish history. It would not have been possible, in fact it would have been impossible, without community support. Today, all thinking Republicans are committed to peaceful and democratic methods to achieve our aims. The IRA is gone. The war is over. Notwithstanding the worrying polarisation of politics here, I believe that the peace process is secure, not least because there is no community support for a return to conflict. On the contrary, the opposite is the case. So there's no threat to anyone from the community represented by Sinn Féin. However, no one should be surprised by the twists and turns that have occurred from the April the 10th, 1998 to now. It's worth recalling that the Good Friday Agreement was achieved without the Ulster Unionist Party talking to Sinn Féin. At that time, apart from the Loyalists, who always engaged and fairness to them with us in a very open way, my only conversations with uh, unionists were in the men's room. And that was only if we were on our own. 
and the DUP didn't even turn up, <laughs> either to the toilet or to the talks. <laughs> in the following 10 years, the political institutions frequently failed to function. Sometimes there's a, you know, we forget that for 10 years, the institutions didn't function really. Some unionist leaders have never fully embraced the equality and parity of esteem principles of the agreement. I'm sick listening to commentators, particularly in RTE, saying that both sides can only work this out, and I include government ministers with respect in that. Everybody knows what the problem is. The problem is that a rump of unionist leaders won't embrace rights for everyone. That's the problem. And they've still to get a leader who will go into the room and say, I'm doing this, back me or sack me. And that's what is required if we're to move this entire process on. We also have to realise that the Irish and British governments always assumed that the outworking of the agreement would be a coalition of the Ulster Unionist Party and the SDLP. It didn't work out like that. And with patience and persistence and perseverance, difficult issues, including putting weapons beyond use and a new policing dispensation were achieved. In 2007, Ian Paisley became First Minister and Martin McGuinness Deputy First Minister. And for 10 years, even though we would have problems with elements of it and all of us would perhaps have criticisms, but for 10 years, the institutions functioned. 14 years ago, and with great reluctance, Martin resigned. The tipping point was the DUP's handling of the renewable heating incentive scandal and the allegations from within the DUP of corruption by some in that party. But there were other difficulties and factors, including the failure by the DUP to embrace, as I've just said, mutual respect, the all ardent approaches which are enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement. And at the same time, for its own narrow party political selfish reasons, the Tory government has actively encouraged the most negative, intransigent and sectarian elements of political unionism to attack and undermine the Good Friday Agreement. And the formal alliance between the DUP and the Tories is causing significant difficulties, not least over Brexit. Brexit not only threatens the two economies of this island, it also threatens the Good Friday Agreement, in particular the human rights elements and safeguards. Currently the institutions are suspended, but it's Sinn Féin's view, and remember we did have a draft agreement with the DUP just over a month ago, but it's Sinn Féin's view that the Irish and British governments must convene the British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference. The responsibility of that conference should be to produce a plan a pathway to bring forward the legislation and the resources to secure those rights and implement the outstanding agreements from 20 years ago. And that's the challenge for both governments. But it's especially a challenge for the Irish government, given the negative stance of this British government, its lack of support for the Good Friday Agreement and Theresa May's pact with the DUP. Notwithstanding these ongoing difficulties, the Good Friday Agreement remains a bedrock of any future agreement and indeed for any progress. It should be unconditionally embraced by all political parties. That's the surest way for outstanding issues at the core of current difficulties to be resolved. I think it's very important for all of us to have a long view of history and the continuum of struggle. I believe there can be no progress without struggle. But of course there are ebbs and flows in any process. And what we have to do is to base our thinking on a clear understanding of the objective reality at this time and of the conditions in which we are struggling. And because of a deficit of positive leadership within unionism at this time, there appears to be only limited chances of progress. However, I stress my view that this is temporary. And it does not mean that we do nothing. Now is the time to build community consensus for change. Now is the time for outreach by progressives, not only to other progressives, although this is vitally important, but also to those who do not share our views. The social and economic interests of working class unionists and loyalists are not well served by the DUP or the Ulster Unionist Party. This is most obvious in this city of Belfast, 
and especially since the death of David Irvine and the electoral decline of the Progressive Unionist Party. So while the peace process needs to be nurtured and developed into a process of communal tolerance and mutual respect, and should never be taken for granted or neglected, there also have to be ways to develop a prosperity process. Because of the scourge of sectarianism, this will not happen in a unifying way across the community without the involvement of progressives from across the community working together, even privately, even in informal ways. And I would like to commend those many great citizens who already engage in this necessary work. Many have done so for very, very long periods in very dangerous times at risk to themselves because they believe, whether they're loyalists or whether they're unionists or whether they're Republicans or nationalists or people of no particular label, they believe in people. That's what drives them. And they particularly believe that young people should be allowed to realize their full potential and they want young people to escape the scourge of sectarianism. Others in the voluntary and community sector give of their times and talent to involve young people in sports and other activities because they also believe in the future. And I've met their counterparts many times in depraved communities in Dublin and Cork and Limerick and in my own constituency of Louth. They're on the ground also in loyalist working class communities tackling suicide, drug abuse, deprivation. I welcome yesterday's initiative by loyalists. Some may be sceptical, fair enough, but I think we have a duty to support all positive initiatives. We should also remind ourselves that there's clearly a consensus and a clear majority in the Northern Assembly for marriage equality, for a Bill of Rights, for Act Nagilga, for legacy mechanisms and other modest entitlements. The agreement also commits the British Government to hold a referendum on unity and to legislate for United Ireland should a majority vote for that outcome. Now Sinn Féin gets criticised for raising this. Why? Why do we get criticised for raising this? Especially from those in government in the South, from those in the Oireachtas, who are supposed to promote the Good Friday Agreement, and it would be more becoming of our critics if they applied themselves to the formidable challenge of persuading citizens in the North who identify as unionists, that their future economic, social, cultural and community well-being will best be found in a new and an agreed Ireland. This is a hundred years of partition. Partition has failed. Let's make no bones at all about that. Centuries of British involvement in Irish affairs have failed. Sinead, that's the truth of it. Now, we have great challenges and great difficulties in developing a future that keeps all of us together and doing so in a sustainable way. But it is time for our people, all of us, on the island of Ireland to shape out our own future. And our responsibility as political leaders always has to be to look forward. Always have to be, has to be to make a future which is different from the past. This community has demonstrated how to do this. The Good Friday Agreement continues to offer hope and optimism. Its promise is for a new dispensation, a new Ireland in which all citizens are respected and where fairness and justice and equality are a reality and the norm. The agreement has not failed. And the agreement will not fail because communities like this one which help to create it are wedded to these principles. So let us face the future with confidence and our own strength and in the certainty that active, empowered and united communities are our best guarantee of a decent future for everyone. Gwaramila Magov. Sinn Féin, Goanna Nis, Carta Agus Eintas Naharan, Equality, Rights and Irish Unity.